Uh, well, I'm going to call him a young guy. It's I'll young. take it. Okay. Uh, doing a presentation, um, and this has to do a little bit with kind of, you know, some of the stuff that we work on in here, a little bit with uh, website, uh, web page design and such, uh, but it's really going to open your eyes a little bit to some of the things. Um, I've actually learned uh, a lot from this presentation, um, and I guess, should we call it uh, the social media survival guide for chronic scrollers? <laughs> So honest, be honest, interact, ask questions, um, and uh, I want to present to you Josh. So let's give it up for Josh. Woo! So yeah, my name's Josh. I am 22. I go to UIC. Does anyone know UIC? Yeah, so uh, I'm here today not to scare you or say that your phones are ruining you or guilt trip you into not looking at your phones. How many of us have had parents or teachers or grandparents or just adults who don't really understand what's going on tell you that you need to get off your phone and you're wasting all your time? Has, has anyone heard that? Yeah, it's, <laughs> right. it's, it, it can get a little bit obnoxious, right? Because they don't, they don't fully understand that our Wait, phone... am I obnoxious? <laughs> well, hey, you didn't I hear it from me. I am sometimes. Right? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's part of what has to happen. But the reality is this is where our life is. And so what I'm here to talk to you about today is how we might be able to make our life on this thing a little bit better or a little bit more meaningful. Um, but yeah, let's get into it. So just right off the bat, are we tired of scrolling? Do, or let me ask it this way. How many of us here feel that on some level we have a negative relationship with social media? Does anybody feel like there, there are some negative sides to social media? Maybe it, it gives us feelings that are uncomfortable or we are spending too much time on it, anything like that. Does, it, does any of that resonate at all? And it's okay if not, because we all have an individual relationship. We have something, maybe some resonance. First of all, for anyone who does feel that way, I am right there with you. You know, like I said, I'm 22. I got my first iPhone when I was 14 years old. I'm guessing you guys got your phones a little bit younger than that. Maybe, raise your hand if you were 10. Any 10 year old first iPhone? Yeah, 11, 12. Yeah, it's pretty young. And so anyway, this is a part of our lives and, and today I wanna to talk to you about um, how we can make it better. So a year ago, I was in a really negative place with my phone. I was constantly scrolling. I was spending a lot of time consuming infinite content on social media platforms. I was not in control of my tech use or my phone use and, and you could see it in my face. So I'm gonna show you a picture from about a year ago when I was in a really negative place and I just, Please promise not to judge me because I really, I was not looking too pretty. This is, this is what I looked like a year ago. It was not, uh, it was not great. I was, had my attention just poured into my phone. I remember I was, I was in a relationship with someone, a, a human, and um, I, I just remember hearing, are you even listening to me? And I wasn't. I was either on my phone looking at content, 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 or I was thinking about content, even when I wasn't on my phone and in a conversation, I wasn't actually talking to them, I was thinking about something else. And you could just see, look at the soulless eyes. I mean, it was not, it was not great. I, and for the record, I'm no longer in that relationship. It's very complicated. Anyway, at a certain point, it became too much. And I think we all have had this, this moment where we're in a really negative place and something has to change and we recognize it. I was on the train, I was coming home from school and I had something of an epiphany. You know what an epiphany is? Sort of like a light bulb moment where I'm suddenly struck by a message that I need to share. So I got home, I raced off of the train, I threw my backpack down, I had a meeting, I just canceled it. And I took out my phone like this and I ranted on TikTok for three minutes about what I was thinking and feeling related to this technology stuff. Look at how angry I look. I am just very frustrated. I said these first, whatever, six words, seven words, I said your attention has been stolen from you. Because I had this inclination, this was a feeling I had within me that this problem, this chronic scrolling, this addiction to infinite internet content is actually not our fault. So when we have parents or teachers or grandparents come to us and say, you need to have more willpower, you need to have more self-control, you are responsible for your own attention span. The reality is, it was stolen from us. We did not choose to enter this information economy and something has to change. So I ranted into my phone, I let out my feelings, I put my phone down, I posted it, and I just moved on with my day. And what happened next was something that I, I did not expect to happen. But it really resonated with a lot of people. And this is the first time that I had put something out there on the internet that was authentic, that was vulnerable, that was true to what I was thinking and feeling, and it really got some traction. There were people who wanted to join the conversation who not only agreed with me, but were willing to share their own experience with this problem. 
And suddenly this, this whole conversation had started and, and I was sort of overwhelmed with notifications, which was its own addictive thing, and we'll get to that in a second. But so then I, you know, I had no choice but to keep going. I wanted to explore this further. So I ended up going to the library the next day, unrelated, and I stumbled by pure chance into a book called Stolen Focus. This is a book that is about winning back our attention span. It's about the 12 underlying causes of the attention crisis. I would highly recommend that you, that you get into this book. Most of what we'll talk about today is solutions oriented because I think we're all tired of hearing about the problem. I think we want to talk about what we can actually do about it. But I, I would recommend you check out this book. Anyway, I make a video, again, ranting into my phone for about three minutes based on what I had read in the book just in 10 minutes. And again, something unexpected yeah. happened a lot more traction, a lot more people really resonated with that because finally someone was talking to them about what we can do. Finally someone was, was saying what they had been thinking. And it, and it confirmed for me a couple things. Number one, I look great on camera. No, the, the main thing is that this is a problem we are not alone with. There are a lot of people who struggle with this and when we think about the amount of people that are on the internet that have a relationship with their phone, this is something that, that relates to everybody. So. Since then, I've continued posting videos. I have helped people with their mental health, and this is what I do. I am on TikTok helping people develop a, a, a healthier relationship with their phones, digital well-being in the very place, on the very platforms that are siphoning our attention out from underneath us. Um, and, and I've been very fortunate to, to help people in that way. So that's what I do now, but let's just stay where we are. Let's zoom back when I read this book, Stolen Focus. It confirmed my core belief behind this, which is that this is not our fault. We entered unwillingly into an information economy that we were not designed to be able to deal with. It was designed to hack our attention. It was designed to reduce us to metrics, to advertising dollars. Social media is addictive by design. This is Johan Hari, he's the author of the book. Um, and what he did, what I discovered through this book also, the Center for Humane Technology. These are the guys who are on the front lines. They are actively working to solve this problem by rebuilding social media. Because let's zoom out for a second and let's look at social media. Let's look at the problem. Okay, we can accept that this is not our fault. We entered a, an, an information economy that we were not prepared for. What does that actually mean? It means that social media is monetized. It makes money in a very specific way. And I'll make it real simple for us today. Our attention as users, as audience members, as consumers is converted into advertising dollars. Has anyone heard this idea before? Is this something, yes. Okay, and, I, and genuinely, I'm just curious because not a lot of people are talking about it. And even though we're all in this machine, even though all of us, for the most part, are on TikTok and Instagram and Twitter and Pinterest and, and YouTube, and we're, and we're not fully in control of our use, of our consumption, we're not talking about how we, as the users, as the consumers, are the product. We are what are, is bought and sold by advertisers. They collect data on us. We have addictive algorithms that track and manipulate us. That's a chapter from the book. And the Center for Humane Technology is run by people who built these features. Tristan Harris, Aza Raskin, these are the guys who were in the room when they designed the infinite scroll, the feature on your phone that makes sure you never, ever, ever reach the bottom of your feed. You can watch videos forever and you're never given an opportunity to reconsider whether you might wanna do something else with your time. Sometimes that's all it takes, a simple moment of reconsideration. We don't get that. You will always be scrolling, Aza Raskin designed that. Tristan Harris was in the room when they designed notifications to be psychologically invasive so that you stay on the app. Notifications show up as red on your phone screen so that the part of your primal psychology that responds to the color red immediately needs to clear that. I need to be on email, I need to clear these notifications, right? Or the buzz, right? They, they design these things so that we are engaged on the apps forever because the more that we're on there, the more money they make. They are incentivized to make money like that. I'm not telling you that everyone who works in Silicon Valley is evil, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the current business model that they use to make money is inherently anti-human. And until we rebuild the social media ecosystem, how it is actually built, the apps themselves, the problem will not go away. Now I wanna just pause for one second. We understand that this is a slot machine, right? Gambling, we know what a slot machine is. One of the last features I wanna to talk to you about specifically with, with social media and how it addicts us is, is something called a variable reward schedule. A variable reward schedule is a very fancy way of saying that when we're scrolling on social media or in a casino at a slot machine, we are rewarded with dopamine. Does everyone know dopamine? Has everyone heard this? It's a, the reward chemical in our brain that ultimately motivates us to pursue pleasure, whether that's food or sleep 
or vaping or smoking weed or going you know, on Instagram and scrolling. These are all forms of dopamine. And we talk about cheap dopamine and good dopamine, cheap dopamine being usually something that doesn't require any effort to get and is typically pretty bad for us, something like scrolling mindlessly or vaping, right? It feels really good. I'm, you know, I'm, trying, I'm right there with you. And, uh, or, or good dopamine, which typically takes effort, something like exercise or, or doing something effortful. Anyway, scrolling on social media and on slot machines gives us that dopamine just irregularly enough, not every time, not every single video, but just irregularly enough that we stay on there. Is it gonna be this video? Am I gonna win this time? So this is a slot machine. And ladies and gentlemen, this is also a slot machine. It has been specifically designed to capture our attention and keep us on the apps forever because we are the product. So what can we do about it? Because we're tired of hearing about the problem. Like I said, I'm not here to stand up in front of y'all and be like, you know, this is, this is a big problem and we have to change it. All right, see you later. Goodbye. You know it's a problem. It's like, we all know it's a problem. What are we actually going to do? Because when I just walked you through how we need to rebuild social media, all of you were thinking, well, what the hell do I have to do with that? Right? That's not something we're going to accomplish in class today. It's not going to happen. This is a massive, massive systemic issue. And so for the rest of my time in front of you today, I want to talk about what we as chronic consumers or, or people on social media can do to become intentional users. What can we actually do about it? How can we consciously redesign our relationship with social media so that we have a positive relationship with our phones? Then we can rebuild social media as a system and meet in the middle. That's the idea. Okay. So you don't have to throw your phone in the ocean. How many of us have found ourselves in a, in a weak moment or you know, we've been scrolling for hours and hours and it's like, okay, I've had enough. I'm gonna delete Instagram. I'm gonna delete TikTok. Goodbye, Twitter. I'm throwing my phone away. I'm moving out into the woods. I'm gonna start a homestead. I'm never going on technology again. Goodbye, social media. How many of us have felt that? Anybody? Anybody? Maybe? If, if, you, if you scroll for long enough and you sink deep enough into a cheap dopamine hole, I promise you, there comes that feeling where you desire that extreme, extreme, response to get out of it. And what I'm here to tell you is that I don't think that this is the best strategy. I have experimented with it myself, and I can tell you that anytime you commit yourself to an extreme process of subtraction, of removing the substance from your life without introducing anything new, it doesn't actually make the problem go away. What it does is it makes you feel the void. You feel the absence of the substance that is giving you something that makes you feel good. If we're using content to self-soothe, if we're using content and scrolling and social media to make our uncomfortable feelings of boredom and anxiety and negative emotion go away, if we just delete all the apps and don't introduce any new strategies or interventions or anything to replace it, then we're just gonna feel that absence and ultimately we'll either hate it the whole time or then fold and download them again and we won't have made any progress. So we're talking about addition, not subtraction. How can we add in, one second, how can we add in positive practices to take the place? Yeah, go ahead. Well, that's why you have um new habits to replace that. Exactly, yeah. that's exactly right. These new habits to replace the negative ones. Have you ever experimented with adding in like a positive new practice to take the place of an old one? Yeah. Would you share that experience with us? Uh, when I used to scroll? Yeah. I would just um, hear the advice of my dad that I started the YouTube channel. Yeah. So I just got hungry for more knowledge and stuff, right? You are so ahead of it. So uh, stay tuned, We're, we are getting there. This is exactly right. What, uh, what's your name again? Elijah. Elijah. What Elijah just shared with us is that when you found yourself in a, in a negative relationship with your scrolling, with social media, you got some advice from your father to start a YouTube channel instead. Okay, everyone, take that. Take that. I want you to just pin that up in your brain. Just keep it right there for one second. I love that. Thank you. So we don't have to throw our phone in the ocean. Technology is not going away. If we delete social media, if we delete our phones and just go out into the woods, all we're gonna feel is FOMO. We have a world that is on the internet and we can't, we can't change that, we can't escape that. So what I'm here to tell you is I believe it's a more productive strategy to flow with the technology, to adjust ourselves, to evolve ourselves so that we can engage with the technology productively like Elijah just pointed out and get the most out of it. We get the best of both worlds. We have technology that is amazing. We have the most powerful technology to connect us to other humans across the world, to teach us anything we want to learn about, anything to pursue our interests, and become the best people that we could possibly imagine while having a great time doing it. And unfortunately, so many of us are isolated in our room scrolling for hours a day. If we can just change our own individual relationship to it, we might be able to turn that tide a little bit. And I want, I want to point out one more time that this doesn't negate the fact that 
this isn't a willpower problem. If you are struggling to regulate yourself, you have to acknowledge that this is a specific system that was designed to hack you. So no, it is not your fault, and no, it is not purely a willpower problem, but we cannot make the problem go away without consciously redesigning our relationship. And we have to acknowledge both of those somewhat contrasting truths. You with me? Okay. So this is the base idea. If you were to leave here today with one idea, let it be this. What we're talking about here is very simple. It's not, it's not easy in practice, but it is theoretically simple. We wanna go from chronic consumption to intentional use. If we're a chronic consumer, we are consuming social media constantly, mindlessly, without a purpose. We accept whatever the next piece of content is. We're just spending time on TikTok, and whatever the next video is, I'm gonna watch that. There's not a purpose. We're just consuming. We're just filling the gap with something, with anything. It doesn't matter what it is. We're not gonna delete TikTok. We're gonna become an intentional user. Look at how, first of all, how creepy is this smiley face? I mean, you can tell I'm not an artist, but you understand the idea here. The idea here is to use the technology productively. We get it. So, how do we do that? Intentional exploration. I know when I say that, it sounds a little bit like woo-woo, like what, what are we actually talking about here? It's, it sounds fancy for no reason. All we're talking about, all we're talking about is identifying our natural interests and then using social media to pursue that. So like way in the back, what's like your favorite thing to do that's off your phone, just for example? Like honestly. Yeah. Go outside. What do you do outside? Play basketball? Yeah, there you go. Right next to you. What's, what's your favorite thing to do? What's your name? Abe. Abe, what's your favorite thing to do that's not on your phone? You like, what is it? Cleaning cars. Cleaning cars. Wow, that's really interesting. So those are two very interesting things that we can actually learn to use social media to enhance. Because what you might not have realized, and maybe you have actually, this is interesting. On social media, you will find a treasure trove of enthusiasts for both of those things. For the specific type of basketball, maybe you like playing basketball, or maybe you like the NBA and learning about it that way, or maybe you like just cars in general, whatever it is, and we don't need to get into it now. But by using the internet to explore those things, you then can consume content consciously and for a reason. And that goes for everyone here. Everyone here has a natural interest. Everyone here has things that we care about. If you think that you don't, if you're like, I don't actually care about anything, it's like, first of all, you do. You might not have found it yet. And the whole idea is using the internet to explore that. Okay. And like Elijah pointed out, this is introducing a new habit to replace an old one and a negative one. So we're not focused on reducing screen time. We're focused on changing the nature of the screen time. Yeah. Sometimes you use the Wi-Fi or the internet I love that. That's exactly right. So you're intentionally using the internet. You're, you're using it for a purpose, and then you end up developing a skill set through doing so. How often do you, is that a part of your life? Like, the, like, uh, like that helped me a lot. Like, uh, yeah. I learned like some a lot. Uh, yeah. Like, uh, from cars, from like YouTube and Google. Like, I know how to fix cars like from 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 the YouTube. That's very cool. Yeah. What's your name? Nasi. What is it? Nasir. Nostri? Yeah. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, that's a perfect example of intentional exploration. That is intentionally seeking to develop a skill set or to learn something or to develop yourself and then using these infinite content platforms that have the potential to ruin our attention span and our time, but using it for a meaningful purpose. And I, I love that. So what comes next, what comes next is to actually engage with that content. So we can curate our feeds. We can curate these algorithms that are designed to keep us on there forever and tell them exactly what we want. So if we like car videos, if we like basketball videos, if we like cleaning car videos, and we want more of them, we can like, obviously, the video, we can comment on it, and then not only get more videos from the algorithm because it sees that we want more of that, but then engage with the other enthusiasts and join in on the conversation. And that's what you saw with the videos that I posted that generated a lot of conversation is people were talking to each other. God forbid you use social media to be actually social, to, to talk to someone else and learn from each other. That's what comes next. And, and the only natural byproduct of that is meaningful social connection. You learn to meet people. You learn to join the conversation and, and develop friends online. Have, those, have it be a real meaningful place that takes the place of consumption. Lonely, isolated, meaningless consumption. 
Suddenly you're in a conversation. Suddenly you're talking about things you, you care about. You're learning about them. Um, and I just want to pause right here temporarily to say that uh, meaningful social connection on the internet is important for what we're talking about, but it is not a replacement for real life social connection. This is a mistake that I made earlier this year when I was learning about these things. I was under the impression that, yeah, you just gotta make friends online, you join a community, you start talking about your passions and, and integrating other people, and then you're good. It's like, no, you, you do need to have friends in the real world, the real world, and you need to have, have a life that is off the screen. That's what we're talking about here. But to share your interests, to participate in your interest on the internet, allows you to connect with other people in a really meaningful way. And then finally, this, this next thing I wanna show you is, is my personal favorite. We're talking about effective replacements for chronic consumption. This is my favorite. And this is what I used to fundamentally change my relationship to the internet seemingly overnight. And that is creativity. Creativity is the direct one-to-one -one replacement for chronic consumption. And this kind of makes sense to us on an intuitive level, right? What is the opposite of consuming, of filling the bottomless pit with ideas and things that don't mean anything to us? It might be to give something back to search within ourselves and find what, what is it that I actually want to say or contribute? What do I have to contribute in the first place? And then let's double click on that word, contribute, because when we hear creativity, we might think of art or music or writing or speech or something, something that is typically, that we might not associate with ourselves. So let's give it a good synonym, which is contribution. Every single person in this room, I promise you, and if you disagree with me, let me know, because I, I would like to hear, but everyone here has something to contribute. You might think to yourself, I'm not an expert. I haven't done anything. I don't, I don't know. I have nothing meaningful to share. And it's like, what well, do you do, actually? You've lived a life. You're what, six, 17, 16, 15? What are we? Between 15 and 18 years old, yes? You have all of these years of experience. You have ideas. You have beliefs. You have things that you care about. Every single part of you that makes you a human being, that distinguishes you from chat GPT and AI, which is on the rise in a very scary way for some of us, that is a contribution. That is something worth sharing. And in doing so, if you are willing to give that to the internet and to share yourself in that way, you change your relationship to the addictive content platforms so that you're not just a consumer, you are a contributor to the information economy. Yeah? Sometimes it's addictive. Say that again for me, louder. Sometimes it's a good thing to what? To consume? Yeah, 100%. Would you say, that's a good question. So do you, do you think that the best way to do that is by having like a purpose or an intention behind it, or like, do you? When you're curious, like you want to know. Yeah, 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 yeah. When you're curious, what is your way of um, learning or consuming on the internet? What do you like to do? I'll just like ask the question, and I'll just give you the answer, the question, kind of find the answer. Oh, you mean in ChatGPT? Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, I'm 100% with you. I think ChatGPT is great. I mentioned that more as like, uh, and this is a little bit of a sidetrack, I love ChatGPT. I think the rise of AI is going to give us some awesome tools that support all of the ideas in here. The idea is to flow with the technology, right? To integrate the technology into our life so that we get the most out of it. What's your name? Aloui. What is it? Aloui. Aloui. Aloui? Yeah. Thank you, Aloui. Yeah. You, that's a really good point. We're talking about taking this technology that is new, that is developing faster than we understand, and using it to get the most out of ourselves and our lives. So I appreciate you bringing that up. That's exactly right. Um, and, and that goes hand in hand with the creativity. This last summer I was working, I was, um, I was writing Twitter content or X content for entrepreneurs. And I used ChatGPT to learn about niches and business models and ideas that I had absolutely no experience with, e-commerce and all these different complicated things. So yes, that's exactly right. Anyway, creativity or contribution is the direct one-to-one -one replacement. This is how we escape consumption is by becoming contributors without disappearing into the woods forever. We don't need to throw our phones away. We can actually engage with the technology productively and become intentional users. Chronic consumers to intentional users. This is what happened for me back this earlier this year when I started posting videos. My relationship to the apps changed. I no longer went on TikTok to numb negative feelings or to escape anxiety. I went on there to engage with the community that I had built, to share my ideas, and to provide some value, to give, to contribute. And then I was not looking to fill this bottomless pit. Because when we get sucked in that consumption cycle, we are never, ever satisfied. Has anyone here ever been trapped in a scrolling cycle and gotten to a video and been like, yeah, I feel good, I'm done, this is good. Has that, I mean, genuinely, has that happened to anyone? Yeah, so is there a point in, when you're on TikTok or Instagram or what, YouTube, any of those three? Where, what is it? TikTok. TikTok, and you get to a video and it's like, yeah, I'm good to go, I'm ready to move on to the next That's thing. Only if it was a bad video, if it was a bad video, I'd get off TikTok. 
Interesting. So it's like when a certain quality drops or when when we get enough videos that don't give us that dopamine rush that we actually step away from the slot machine. I like the videos and then like, cause I use that, if I get like two or three in a row, I just get off of it and go like to a different one. Yeah. And then maybe onto Instagram at that point and go through your stories. Yeah, I, I totally get it. And so we can circumvent that. We can step aside from that. We can change our relationship to that by choosing to intentionally create. Okay. We still need to set boundaries. So let's flash back for a second. It's March of this year. I've just posted that second video with this stolen focus book and it blew up and suddenly my phone is bombarded with notifications. And for the longest time, that's what I thought I wanted. If I can just build an audience, if I can just get all this attention on myself, then all my problems will be solved and I'll be living the dream. What I saw at that point is even though I just made a video about using technology consciously and having a healthy relationship and winning back our attention span, all these big ideas, suddenly I was on my phone for even longer going through all these notifications, right? Because how are you not gonna click on that? 99 plus people in my DM or you know, in the comment section telling me I'm amazing, I'm gonna click on it right away and I'm gonna spend so long on there. Yeah, go ahead. Sometimes usually people like, you know, when they think they're famous, like they just leave it as that. So it still looks like they're famous. Is that right? They leave their notifications? So it's like, yeah, I'm pretty cool. I got 99 plus people. Yeah, I get it. And, and, and then let's also just, let's look at this picture real quick. We see that it's red. That red notification is obviously intentional because when we see that, there's a part of our brain that is wired this way that associates that color with hunger, with desire, right? With to pursue, to click, urgency. I need to click on it, and it is that way so that we go to it. It was designed for maximal engagement. And that's not something we're gonna change in this room. We'll get to that in a second. Anyway, my phone was still hacking me. Even though I had generated the success and I had started to change my relationship, I was now turning to these apps to produce, to contribute, to create, I still was getting sucked in. And so that's why we need to set boundaries. So. I'm gonna make this really simple. There are a lot of apps, there are a lot of tools and external system and, and fancy toys to control our focus and to regulate ourselves. I personally, and this is gonna be individual to everyone in this room, I personally am not a huge fan of them. I keep my boundary system very simple. And when I say boundary system, I mean things that we set in place as conscious users to protect our focus. So for example, there's a website called Freedom. You can open it up on your, on your computer and it will block the internet for a set period of time. You can buy a lockbox that is specifically designed for you to put your phone in and then you close it and then it will not open back up for a set period of time that you can program onto it unless you were to break it like an absolute maniac. Um, I'm not a fan of those. Why? Because I believe the more powerful transformation would be, a, would be for you to be able to regulate yourself. Again, this is not purely a willpower problem, but wouldn't it be nice to be able to trust yourself? To be able to be in control of your phone and not feel like it's sort of this tug of war battle for control. That even though the apps are addicting, and even though they were designed to hack your brain, we are in control. So I, I keep my, my boundaries very simple. I use do not disturb, I keep my notifications off, mm -hmm. because those are very, very invasive. They buzz and they come up, we all know what that's like. We're conditioned into looking right away. So I just keep my phone on do not disturb, I'm also not telling you that you have to do this. I'm just sharing with you how, as users, we can be intentional about this stuff. The other one that I really like is turning the blue light off at night. If you go into your, into your settings, to, first of all, anyone know about these? Has anyone experimented with either of those features? Anybody? Australia, yeah, yeah. You can turn off the blue light at night. It helps your, your brain start to wind down so it doesn't get those rays in your eyeballs that, that keep you awake, that's helpful. But by and large, the, the most effective boundary that I set is just having a plan in the first place. Just understanding what I want from the social media, what I want to use it for, having that intention, and then having a clear schedule by which I use it. So I'll create something in the morning and then I won't check it for, for several hours. Maybe I'll check it once, go through the comments and engage with people. And I am a creator, like I have to, I have to talk to them. I do have to engage, or I want to as well. And then maybe a bit later after that, but just having a plan in place so that I'm not constantly pulled back into it. What we're talking about here is fostering a healthy relationship. Whether we like it or not, all of us have a relationship with technology. We have a relationship with the internet, we have a relationship with our phones, and in a very real way, this right here is an extension of ourselves and our lives. And it's not necessarily a bad or scary thing if we can have a healthy relationship, which requires just two things, just two things, 
clear intentions and clear boundaries, like I've just said. Clear intentions are what we want from it, right? Elijah running a, a, a YouTube channel, using the technology, using the social media for a purpose, right? Or learning a specific skill set, right? That's the intention. And then having a boundary. I will not be invaded by notifications. I'll have them off. Or, or if you want to use one of the more involved systems like a lockbox or the Freedom app, you can go ahead and try that. But having a plan and having a schedule in the first place makes a very big difference, and that's how we can have a healthy relationship with our phone. None of us want to be in a toxic relationship. Now, what does it actually look like? What does it look like to be intentional? To be an intentional user, to use social media consciously. I'm gonna to give to you three templates, three intentional user archetypes that any of us, I'm sure there's something for everyone here. What does it actually look like? Well, there, there, there's three ideas that I have, and I wanna run you through each one. They're also on the handout that you guys have, and then also after today, uh, there are prompts on the back of the handout to help you do a little bit more introspection and find out what actually resonates with you. Um, okay, so the challenger. The challenger is someone who does not want to be a part of social media. I do not want to be a part of it. I don't need Instagram. I don't need TikTok. I don't need X or Twitter or Pinterest or YouTube. I, it's, it's too addictive. It's too negative. And I would just rather live in the real world. I would rather pursue something else like car cleaning or basketball and just do that and not be on social media. Great. That's fine. You can do that. That's what the challenger does. They prefer to live in the real world. Uh, maybe they don't delete them altogether, but they, they minimize their time. They, there's, and the, the way that they do that, by the way, is not by focusing on reducing their screen time. They do not focus on subtraction, they focus on addition. How can I replace this negative habit with something positive? So if they're into something creative, so hang on, let's go back. If we look at the challenger, they're still filling their time with a creative hobby. They just might not share it on the internet. So they've replaced scrolling and mindless consuming with something in the real world that has nothing to do with the internet. But what if we like social media? Maybe you're a curator. The curator is someone who knows that they like content and knows they want to have a, a conscious, meaningful relationship with it. So they engage in conscious consumption. They're looking at things for a reason. They have interests, they have tastes, they have hobbies, they have pursuits, they have passions, right? And they consume content related to it and then organize it. Now this organization is very important for one reason, which is that there is more content on the internet than we could ever, ever possibly go through. It's infinite and it's overwhelming. It's why you're on social media and, and you'll never ever reach the bottom. It is more than we could ever hope to go through. And curators are helpful in, in the sense that they consume it for a reason and then package it up. Who here has seen on YouTube those like 10 hour music playlists with like different songs and sections? You know, have, have we seen those? Yeah, that's an excellent example of curation. That's someone who took time out of their day to enjoy their passion, to enjoy art, to appreciate it, to really consume it and enjoy it and get all the good things out of it and then package it up for someone else to appreciate it. That's curation, that's organization. Or on TikTok, you'll see like videos or like even meme compilations, right? On TikTok, you'll see like hilarious memes and like music under it, that's, that's curation. And when we look at something like that, we don't immediately think, okay, this is doing a lot of good for humanity, but what it is doing is for the curator themselves, the person who made it, it changes their relationship to the app. It gives them something more productive and more meaningful to do than purely consume. Now, this brings us to the last one, which is maybe you like consuming consciously, Maybe you wanna pursue your passions, you wanna use social media for good, right? You wanna lean into what fires you up and you also wanna take it a step further and start sharing your ideas. And in that case, you are a creator. Now, no, this isn't like the best one. I did save it for last because it's usually what we think of first. We think of YouTubers and Mr. Beast and people who have these massive followings and, and we're not talking about building a social media empire and making a lot of money and becoming famous. That's a talk for another day, and I'd love to talk about that because it's, it's very cool and very possible. But what we're talking about is just changing the relationship to the point where you are learning to share yourself on the internet, share your humanity online, and connect with people and, and bring your own ideas into this ecosystem through true contrib contribution. Not everybody is gonna wanna take out their phone and talk to their phone or a camera and post it on YouTube. Maybe you find that cringe. Maybe you cannot stand the idea of your friends and your family and your coworkers and your girlfriend seeing a video of you talking on the internet. And that's fine. I would challenge you on that and say that it is worth it and, and, and you know, you gotta do you for you. But if it's not for you, that's fine. There are plenty of other ways to engage. That's why we started with Challenger and Curator. So I would encourage you after today to take some time to go through those questions. You don't have to write anything down if you don't want to, but just think about that. Think about what it would look like for you to engage in social media positively. Just in a perfect world, 
What does it look like? Maybe you don't have a problem. Maybe it's great. Maybe you have spent enough time doing things you know, offline that, that it's not an issue for you. And if that's the case, amazing. But we have choice here. We have more power than the big tech companies want us to believe. We are in control. We have more control than we think. And we're talking about the bottom up solution here. Redesigning our relationship with social media so that as the brilliant people at the Center for Humane Technology work to rebuild social media from the ground up, we can meet in the middle and be the intentional users of a digital society that actually serves us uh, and is not reducing us to, to advertising dollars and drive attention spans. Okay, so you know this is gonna be hard. Um, anytime we introduce change, it's gonna be challenging because our brain does not like change. Change is inherently uncomfortable, even if it's something cool like making videos or engaging consciously with social media. Um, any kind of change is uncomfortable, which is why we spend so much of this time talking about addition and fun and chasing the enjoyment of this, right? I personally have never achieved a positive change in my life from uh, coming from a place of guilt or shame or having David Goggins scream at me saying, you need to call us your mind, you need to be, I think discipline is great, huge fan of discipline. But all of the rhetoric around you're not good enough and you're not enough and you're not gonna do this because you're weak and you need to suffer to make this right. In my opinion, I have never ever seen that work really long term for someone in creating positive change. So when we look at this mountain and we look at this change we're try, try, trying to achieve, all of it needs to come from a place of joy, true pleasure. Because if it's not fun, if it's not enjoyable, if consciously consuming or challenging the social media system altogether or creating and sharing our, our ideas online, if that's not enjoyable for us, we're not gonna do it and we're gonna be stuck in the same self-soothing scrolling cycle that we're trying to get out of. This is my motto, humanize the internet. This is the, the framework that I have lived by for the last several months and what I'm really committed to. And I'm committed to doing that through creativity. I'm committed to helping people figure out what it is that they can contribute, how they can have the best relationship online and it's gonna look like a lot of different things. You will have your own individual path with it. And while I did give you archetypes and templates to inspire you, it, like you gotta figure this out for yourself. Everyone has their own individual relationship with their phone, but we are going to humanize the internet by making this place more human. It does not make sense to have a social media information ecosystem that is designed to reduce you to advertising dollars. You are not a product, but you can be a producer. You can be a contributor. And I think that's something to really consider. Last thing here, um, when you really think about it guys, our attention, our focus, our consciousness is the only thing that we have. It's the only thing that we are. I mean, yes, you have a hand and you have legs and you have a physical body, but if you go deeper than that, the only thing that you are is a consciousness. You are an attention span. And so that is, that is all we have. It is our most precious cognitive resource. And that is why intentionality will save us from having it stolen out from under us. The social media machine as it's built right now is coming for every second of your time. It is an infinite economic growth pursuing system to get as much money and time and attention out of you as possible. And only through intentional use can we start to pull ourselves out of it before the system itself, the actual machine is redesigned. So let's remember how important our focus is. And, and I, I really do mean it when I say, thank you for your attention. That's it, thanks guys. Uh,